Welcome to the Fantastic Fiction and KGB Reading Series. Fantastic Fiction is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month, hosted by Ellen Datlow and me, Matthew Kressel. We spotlight well-known and up-and-coming science fiction, fantasy, and horror authors, and admission is always free. We publish a monthly podcast and video so people who can't attend the in-person event can still enjoy the reading like to support the series, you can donate at kgbfantasticfiction.org slash support. Anyway, on to the show. All right. How's everyone doing this evening? All right. Welcome to Fantastic Fiction at KGB. I'm Matt Kressel. I co-host the series with Ellen Datlow. We've been going for more than 20 years. Can you believe that? Here at the KGB bar. Never a cover charge. Never a charge. Always free to get in. Only thing we ask is that you buy a drink hard or soft and you tip your bartender, Mary, who's working hard to keep you hydrated. Please. You support the bar, you support the series, you keep, keep us going forever. Um, as you know, because you're here, we are now on the second Wednesday of the month instead of the third. We recently switched, so uh, clearly you've updated your calendars for all those who have not. Sorry, you missed tonight. There is a podcast, though, kgbfantasticfiction.org. If you can't make the series, you can listen to us, you can listen to the reading. And I think we have archives going back now about eight, nine years. So, yeah, uh, we got a lot of guests uh, on that podcast. And we also, during the pandemic, we did a live YouTube uh, virtual reading um, we had people like Joe Hill and uh, William Gibson, people you may have heard of, like N.K. Jemison. So yeah, j- check us out on YouTube. Um, so real quick, We're about to. I'm about to. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. It's all right. It's all right. She's excited. We're all excited. It's October. Halloween's almost here. I wish, you know, we should have all worn costumes. It would have been fun. Right? Um, yes. So. It costs us money to run the series. It costs us about $2,000 a year. Um, we give the, the guests a stipend. Uh, we take them out to dinner. We pay for their drinks. It costs us about 2000 a year. Uh, so we're almost out of money from our last fundraiser, which I think was 2018. Um, so we're doing a GoFundMe to raise money for three more years. We're trying to get $6,000 to keep going for three more years. We're at $2,500 now. Uh, you can check us out if you go to kgbfantasticfiction.org. You can see the link to the GoFundMe there. Um, please, if you can, you know, donate uh, if you can. We're we're super appreciative. Um, we wanted Ellen and I wanted to give away stuff, but two things. Uh, first, GoFundMe doesn't let you give out actual prizes. There's like a clause or something, and they 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 actually shut down our fundraiser briefly because we were giving away stuff. Um, we used to do a Kickstarter where we gave give away like all these prizes, but it was just it's like really it's a full time job. It's pain in the ass. Yeah, it's a full time job. So uh, this time around, um, we were just we were really busy, couldn't do that unfortunately. But you know, you'll have us, you'll have us right? And you'll have the series. So um, we really appreciate uh, everyone helping keep the series going during during the pandemic when we weren't at the bar and before obviously and after so thank you all for coming appreciate it uh, I'm excited about our guests tonight we have Meg Elison and Clay McLeod Chapman uh, reading for us uh, so um, yes our first reader is going to be Clay McLeod Chapman uh, I have here a copy of Clay's new book, Ghost Eaters. Check it out. So it's out. It's where is Clay? Where are you? There, why are you sitting over there? You're the GOH. You should be sitting up here. He's being sociable. Yeah. Okay. Sociable is fine. Um, so your bio says September 20th. So this book's out already. That book is out. This book is out. Okay. Yes. Ghost Eaters. Woo! Purchase now at your favorite bookseller. Right here. Right here. Your favorite bookseller could could be. Clay, right? So, uh, Clay has books for sale, so please, at the break, come up, get a, uh, buy a book, get it signed. And uh, yeah, so Clay McLeod Chapman writes books, comic books, children's books, for f- and for film and television. His upcoming novel, or novel already out, Ghost Eaters, hit shelves on September 20th from Quirk Books. 
He lives in Brooklyn. Here's Clay McLeod Chapman. Hey guys, uh, thank you so much for, for coming out tonight. Uh, and thanks to Ellen and Matthew for uh, letting me come on board. Thanks to Meg for, for sharing the stage. Um, I, I'm really excited to be here. I, uh, I have this new book out and it's called uh, Ghost Eaters. And it is all about a haunted drug. So imagine you could pop a pill and see the dead. Um, and uh, this, the, the book kind of revolves around uh, a circle of friends. Um, their names are Erin, she is the protagonist. Uh, her friends Amara, Silas, and Tobias. Um, and it turns out that their friend Silas, who was the kind of de facto ringleader of the group, uh, passed away of an overdose. Turns out the drug he was uh, taking was called Ghost. And Ghost is, well, I'm gonna let them tell you a little bit about it. So they're gonna try to, they're gonna do a little seance and see if they can contact their friend. Um, here we go. Thanks for coming out, guys. Tobias doles out another dose of Ghost for each of us. One for you, one for you, and one for me. Eye contact, I say, you know, trying to bring a little levity to our drug-induced seance. Cheers, Amara mumbles, not meeting my eyes. We all pop the pills in our mouths and swallow them without another word, chasing them down with as much water as we can stomach. But the living room actually feels different in the daylight. You know, smaller? The night before, the room itself seemed to expand, the wooden beams stretching over our heads. I mean, it felt like we had been devoured by some prehistoric plywood beast. But everything looks harsh and dusty in the sunlight. Close your eyes, Tobias starts. And I glance at Amara before I do, but she won't look at me. We wish to speak to those that we've lost, Tobias announces. His voice sounds far away, as if it's coming from the corner of the living room, even though I can still feel his knee pressed up against mine. Silas, if you can hear us, we want you to know that we are here. And I strain my ears as much as I can. I want to hear something, hear him, his voice. Aaron, Tobias squeezes my hand. It's your turn. Reach out to Silas. I don't know what to do. I mean, what am I, what am I supposed to say? If my eyes were open, I, I would feel like a complete idiot, but behind my eyelids, any feelings of self-consciousness begin to ebb. The presence of both Amara and Tobias slowly recedes from my mind's eye. There's no one else now. It's just me and Silas. Can you hear me, Silas? God, the longer my eyes are closed, the more I notice certain patterns. Diamond-shaped helixes emerge from the darkness and spiral across my eyelids. It's me, Silas. It's Aaron. And the helixes twirl faster at the sound of Silas's name. They fluctuate in color, red to purple to green. <laughs> as they gain speed. Are you there, Silas? And the temperature rises up my back before radiating throughout the rest of my body. The room is muggier now. The, the plastic tarps trap the warmth of the sun in the room. I mean, it feels like a sauna in here, overheating. Silas, Tobias says, we're here. Can you hear us? Silas, I jump in. I don't want Tobias to reach him first. I know you're here, Silas, please. The presence of my body, the very sensation of my skin fades. I'm dissolving. I mean, I can't tell where my skin is anymore, where I stop and the house starts. Silas, if you can hear me, I want you to... I want you to know that I never left you. I am the house. Every room is a chamber of my heart. Every hallway, an artery, every beam, a bone. All I need now is a ghost. I'm ready to be haunted. 
for Silas's spirit to possess this vessel. I never left you, Silas. I never meant to hurt you. The fluctuating colors behind my eyelids compresses themselves, taking shape, a silhouette. I wish that I could take back everything I said that night, nice, Silas. I wish I could go back and the floor creaks behind me, a footstep. I mean, it's, it's such an abrupt sound that I, I, I can't help but open my eyes, and I'm immediately met by harsh sunlight. The, the, the sun has actually shifted, seemingly in a matter of minutes, or, or have we been sitting here for hours now? I don't know anymore. I mean, it's long enough for the sun to move along its path, the light sliding across the living room. I love you, Silas. I miss you. I... A pocket of shadow in, uh, remains in the far corner. The sun can't reach that far into the room. There's something palpable within the darkness, something growing, gaining potency. And then the shadow starts to move. Something, someone, is standing in the far corner. Do you see that? I hear myself ask. But it doesn't sound like the words are coming from me. Tobias glances around the room. See what? In the corner. Right there. Amara won't look behind her. She refuses to see. Her focus remains on the floor, the walls, the ceiling, anything but that far corner of the living room, anywhere but there. But the silhouette steps forward, out from the shadows. I mean, the darkness follows as if it somehow drags the shadows with it, tugging on that black, a web spindling out from the wall. I see him. I see him. Silas? Where? Where is he? Tobias asks, unable to hide his anxiety. His head whips around the room, desperate to see, and when he finally does... Oh, the stillness that takes over his face is so sudden. It's as if someone pressed pause on his body. The only thing that moves are his eyes, frenzied, and he whispers, It's him. Silas, I... Mm. My throat is too dry. Uh, I need water. Um, but I can't look away from him. I can't bring myself to break eye contact. He might disappear again. Silas, it's me. It's, it's Aaron. Saying his name out loud seems to give him life. I'm giving him life. As if it's enough to endow his uh, existence once more. Can you hear me, Silas? Can you see me? A name is a vessel. It holds certain syllables, certain cadences. If you say them in a certain order, in a certain rhythm, you are able to invoke the very breath of God. And I want to say Silas's name with life again. I want to say his name out loud and have it sound the way that I used to say it when he was alive. I want to say his name with all of my heart to endow every letter with love, everlasting love. Silas! I cough. There's something caught in my throat, but I, but I can't look away from him. Silas, it's me. It's Aaron. I'm here, Silas. I... Something thick begins to move up my esophagus. I, I, I can hear myself wretch. It's wet, labored. Aaron? Amara's hand tightens its grip around, my, around mine, squeezing my fingers, but whatever is rising up my throat now blocks the airway. I can't breathe. And Amara yanks on my arm, and I pray that the pleading look in my eyes broadcasts my absolute inability to inhale. I can't breathe. My chest heaves once, twice. I can't breathe. The bulge in my throat works its way up. I can't. Silas is gone. I mean, if he was even there to begin with. I mean, he was, wasn't he? I did see him. What's wrong? Tobias asks, kneeling before me. What is? And I wretch once more. My entire body starts to seize. Aaron! A tendril of white, wet substance pushes past my lips. And it coils and oscillates in front of my tear-stained face, branching out and upwards. A root 
reaching for the sun. Holy shit! Tobias pushes away from me, his eyes fixated on the tendril, but my jaw locks, unable to close, as I continue to expel this substance from deep within me. It just keeps coming and coming, whatever it is, unspooling, blooming in the air above our heads. I can't breathe, I can't breathe, can't. Amara reaches out to touch it. Don't! Tobias starts. The tip of her index finger barely grazes the surface of that writhing mass, wet and alive. Tobias tries to pull Amara's hand away. Don't touch it! The mass ruptures. Whatever suspended itself in the air immediately loses its, its hold the moment Amara touches its slippery surface and it falls to the floor and bursts into a yellowish liquid that appears to contain the contents of my last meal. Trail mix and bile splash across the floorboards and I feel as if I have just broke through a body of water finally able to breathe again and I gasp for air drawing in deep, ragged breaths as I expel the last of the drug from my stomach. Aaron, Aaron! I look at Amara. The terror in her expression is unmistakable. What? I say, hacking uncontrollably, and I hold out my arms to her. I need to hold someone. I need to feel safe. What? It's okay. It's okay. I got you. And Amara opens her arms, and I collapse into her, letting her take my trembling body and keep me from shaking. But I can't stop. And she combs the wet hair out of my face with her fingers, using her sleeve to wipe the vomit from my cheeks. What was that? I shriek. Tobias is practically hyperventilating. The elation on his face just sends a chill right through me because I know exactly what that expression means. It works. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, KGB. Thank you, Ellen and Matthew. Thank you, Meg. Um, it's a little cr crass, forgive me, but if you were interested, I do have books for sale. Bye, have a good night. <laughs> So we were gonna take a break, have a drink, buy some books, and he'll sign them for you. And we'll be back in a bit. Ow! Hello, welcome back. It should be too high for Meg too, I think. I, Meg, are you mind? Okay. All right, it's too all right. Hopefully it, you'll have to adjust it. Hello everybody, welcome back. This is the second half of Fantastic Fiction at KGB. And people still ask, what's KGB, you know, on Facebook, I'll mention it, like, is that KGB, the Russian KGB? <laughs> it's like, no, it's a reading series, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, please, um, before we welcome our next reader, the people we have coming up Woo! are... Coming attractions. Coming attractions. November 9th, Stephanie Feldman and Eileen Gunn. Woo! December 14th, Cassandra Kaur and Richard Cadry. Who both live in New York now. God damn. Yeah. January 11th, uh, Christopher Savaska, Savaska, yeah? Yeah. And TK. Woo. February 8th, Marie Vibert, Vibert? Vibert. 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 And Woo. TK. She's a Midwesterner. <laughs> okay. Oh, is she? Oh, I thought yeah. she would be French. Cleveland. Cleveland. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, March 8th, Scott Lynch and Elizabeth Bear. Scotty Lynch. Woo. Yeah. Uh, April 12th, Peng Shepard and another TK. In May, I didn't write the date, but anyway, John Langan and Paul Tremblay. Oh, on June 14th, Nathan Ballagrin and Dill Bailey. So we have Woo! a bunch of interesting people coming up over the next several months. But right now, we have a very interesting, I think this isn't close enough, but she'll adjust it when yeah. she gets up here. Anyway, it's all right, whatever, she'll adjust it when she gets up here. Anyway, please welcome Meg Ellison, who is a Philip K. Dick and Locus Award winning author, as well. <laughs> Yay! as well as a Hugo, Nebula, Sturgeon, and otherwise finalist. A prolific short story writer and essayist, Elison has been published in Slate, McSweeney's, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Fangoria, Uncanny, Lightspeed, Nightmare, and other places. 
Elison is a high school dropout and a graduate of UC Berkeley. Please welcome Meg. Meg. Ah, Meg. Okay. All right. All right. So, yeah. All right. Meg Elison. Good. 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 Good evening, everybody. My newest book, Number One Fan, was published in August. It is a horror thriller about a best-selling author who wakes up in the basement of her number one fan. I'm not reading from that tonight because I hate fucking excerpts. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah, buy the book. Please buy the book. Available wherever fine books are sold. Currently, a staff pick at the Strand. <laughs> tonight. I'm going to read you The Pizza Boy, which is published in the September-October issue of Fantasy and Science Fiction, and it's about being a pizza boy in space. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. My father was a pizza boy, too. His father had gone off to fight in the Garretes Cluster and left him in charge of the family ship since he was the oldest of the children. He was only 15, but his mother was a surgeon and there was no one else to do it. He taught me everything I know. It's 42 deliveries tonight. The first dozen went to the same big medical transport received by an orderly in their scooter bay. Those were the hottest, and he immediately pulled the lid up on the top pod. No mushrooms? I shake my head. We're out. His face falls considerably, and he nods, and I'm sure that'll come out of my tip. The next three go to a troop transport, and I know the guy who meets me in the bay is from comms because of his ear implant. He does the same thing, pulling the seal on the top pod and letting the hot scent puff out all around us. No mushrooms tonight, huh? They're getting harder to find, I tell him. I'm going to a spot tomorrow that I know. Hopefully I'll have mushrooms again when your credits come in. He nods and goes back to work, carrying pizzas like a hero to his comrades. The fleet is stretched out over half a sector, but my scooter is fast and my pods are well-engineered to keep pizzas hot. The Imperial Marines do not ask about mushrooms. They also don't tip, and I scoot back home. My ship, the Mehatable, has to grow its own tomatoes for sauce. Dad had a source for them, some hippies running hydroponics outfit on some barely terraformed asteroid back in 67. But he came back one day and told me they were wiped out in a skirmish between the Queen's Armada and the Kralian rebels. He was crying. I don't know if they were friends or if it was just the tomatoes. <laughs> Either way, my dad couldn't stand it. Dad recultured the cell, cell lines himself when the clones started to fail. He created a diverse set of offspring from that one singed plant we had left. He and Mom worked together, applying the best of her organic chemistry and his exobotany and horticulture. The Mehedible really didn't have the space to spare, and tomatoes apparently need gravity, as well as hydroponics. Without synth G, they bash against each other in flight. Their shapes are lumpy and their flesh is mealy. So there's one corridor now that's always too wet and too warm, and the tomatoes hang down from a trellis they built into the ceiling. The tomato struts from a Queen's Armada dinghy they pulled apart when they salvaged the battlefield after the clue defensive. Every time I pick tomatoes for a pot of sauce, I try to remember what Dad told me about how every little piece of the cycle is important. Mom was drafted by the QA right after I was weaned. I barely remember her. Dad went out after mushrooms one day last year and never came back. I hope he got his wish and he was buried in some actual dirt. That's their place in the cycle. I don't know mine yet. Our sauce recipe hasn't changed in a couple hundred years, and it came from some place called Samarazzo, system unknown. Dad had it written on actual paper, pressed in borosilicate, and bonded to the wall in the galley. We lost it with a secondary hulk de decompression when I was a kid, and I remember Dad holding an iron pan to the seam and welding it in the wall to stop the leak. He stood there, tears in his eyes, staring after it. The pan is still there. I still oil its surface. Dad wiped his eyes and told me he knew the recipe by heart anyway. The tomatoes have to be stewed and crushed in the pan. After you saute axarb garlic with a little shaved lirap onion, not too much, they're sharp. He usually shaved the fat off of some preserved sausages to get it all going, some spicy thing he picked up in the space station market in the DMZ. Who knew what was in it, grubs? Frogs, men, sausages can be anything at all. We'd talk while he showed me how to do it, told me how sausage was made somewhere else. Why does it matter, Dad? What? He looked at me from the sizzling pan, frowning. 
Why does it matter? All the steps and the specifications, the secret sauce matters, and the mushrooms matter. Why the rest of it? He put down his spatula and looked at me hard. The sauce was as red as blood. The effort proves you're a pizza boy, he said. <laughs> the effort is what keeps you safe. Any idiot rebel can create a fake delivery to relay a message, and they will always get caught. This pizza has to be good so that someone who receives it has no idea what we're doing and would never guess it has any other reason to exist. Do you understand? If the pizza is good, the pizza boy is safe. Never forget that. I don't forget anything. The batches of blood red sauce are 100 liters apiece, and I freeze some to use for the following week. They bounce around in the zero-g deep freeze that just sucks in the cold from outside the ship. The Mehedible was built for efficiency. The oven siphons heat directly off the engines, and so do the sleep pods. Never waste heat, Dad said. I never waste anything, and I do everything the way he did it. Cheese is the big problem, and I can't make it myself. There are four dairy ships that follow the QA, and they used to sell clabber that they couldn't use. And then one of them figured out their own efficiency and found a way to put it to use. Dad was devastated. We had just made contact with the planetary orbit market when he disappeared. There are a handful of planets in this system that produce cheese, but my favorite is the one with the thousands of little islands, the planet in the seas, Benny Benny. The dairymen don't say much, but they use the same code with me that they established with Dad. Their sea cows produce green milk after eating kelp all day. The cheese those farmers make is milky green and jade, rich and salty as hell. It comes in in round plugs of varying weights, and they weigh them in front of me every time I pick up. They look at me deeply, their horizontal pupils unknowable. We don't speak, but I get the message. I had to pull all the salt out of the sauce recipe to compensate for this cheese, and the kelp adds umami like you wouldn't believe. But it bubbles and it stretches, and people always rave about it on our review system. That keeps them coming back. If I deliver to a true transport once, I know that the following week I'll be trundling along in their wake, taking orders from soldiers who saw it or smelled it, but didn't get any. And always the question about mushrooms. Sometimes from someone I didn't expect to ask. Sometimes I have to look them over to figure out whether they mean it as a matter of taste or something else. The thing is, I went for gray mushrooms two weeks ago when I knew I'd need them. There's only one place left for them now. I went back to the spot where Dad went last, and he wasn't there, and neither were any of our mushrooms. It was illegal for him, for any of us, to be on a planet. When the QA moved on, it really wasn't one anymore. Atmosphere burnt off, and nothing left. The spot I go to now, Dad discovered it. He didn't tell me he seeded the spores himself, but he was so proud and protective of it that I had to believe it was his work. Or somebody knew. It's on the dark side of LU-5, a tidally locked celestial dwarf that's almost uninhabitable after the QA used icon torpedoes on it back in 69. They say the radiation is deadly. There are people living here. I've seen them. The spore farm is on the underside of a downed Lidor ship. Its spars cracked and resting upside down, like an animal with its legs in the air. It's dark and it's warm and drippy down there. Dad always said that the first spore drop was like hitting a temperate planetoid with ice meteors seeded with tardigrades. Instant life. This place is temperate enough, but the surface is solid bismuth, no soil. They grow slowly, if they grow at all. When I was there a few weeks ago, the mushrooms were just coming back. I knew that soon their broad purple heads would jut out at every angle, growing up and down and sideways from every surface and rock. Back in the deep, where it's almost a cave, I saw the white bone of one of the corpses that fed the spores. He was old when I was a kid. I can't imagine how he's still recognizable back there. The conditions are perfect for rot, but he doesn't seem to change much. I can see the curve of one of his eye holes. It's as if he's always winking at me. I got my gather kit and I'm reaching for it, a little cluster with long stalks and small caps, and those have the best flavor. But then I feel the muzzle of a blaster nestle into the dimple over my right kidney. Just one layer beneath my good Pyron suit, and I freeze. I'm a non-combatant, I say, as I have a thousand times before. I have no planet. I turn around and face the blacked-out dome visor of an Imperial Marine of the Queen's Armada. Identify yourself. Giuseppe Yang Verdi, 879.5, Spacer. I was born in the Mahedible, and I am her captain. Two other Marines close in behind me, one holding the gun. I clamped down on the impulse to lose this morning's water ration. Verity, 
That's the pizza boy, says one of the Marines over their comms link. They're open to me. They're not trying to keep me from hearing anything. What are you doing here, pizza boy? I gesture slowly in one hand at the mushrooms growing above my head. Gathering ingredients? <laughs> That's all. <laughs> they can see my face through my visor. It's just shield yellow, not opaque. I'm trying to smile. You deliver to everyone, one of them says with nearly a spit. The Lido, the Clutie, anybody with cred. I'm a non-combatant, I say again. I don't take a side. I just make pizza. Well, not today. One of the other two steps forward and gestures around my mushroom cave. We are commandeering this site in the name of the queen. Come on, guys, I say without thinking. They'd kill me for less. They just watch me. I can't see their expressions change. I don't know if they're amused by me or totally deadpanning and waiting for the order to kill me. I can feed this place for the next 50 years. I could grow mushrooms. It's not dirt, but it's not bad. What do I know about dirt anyway? I'd like to be mushrooms. They may not look like much, but they've lived a noble life. This planet was forfeit after the battle was won. There are rebel encampments here and it isn't safe. Do you know it's illegal for you to be planet side? The Marines comms are clean. No buzz, no static. LU-5 was declassified as a planet. It's a celestial dwarf now, according to your queen. I try to keep it steady, act like I'm just a punk kid with an attitude, nothing more. The one closest to me smacks my helmet with their armored glove, hard. My head rocks and I smash my teeth and lips against the visor. I see blood there before I taste it. I struggle not to fall. She's your queen too, you fucking space rat. Show me your tag. I produce my identification tag and hold my breath while they scan it. It is correct. I have never tried to falsify my ID. I have to do this in plain sight. Dad told me over and over again. I always think that this will be the moment. They figured you out and there's a warrant in the system. They found Dad's body same way and he had something incriminating on him. Seconds ticked by and the winds on LU-5 never die down. The Marine reads the results to the others rather than to me. Verity, Mehedible, clean. To me, he says, you belong in your can. Never touching the surface of a rock. You're not like us. We are earning our home world. The other helmets nod. This is their catechism. We were born in space, but we will die on the ground with honor. We will watch the suns nurture our crops and feed our grandbabies. Rebels and traitors and nobodies like you deserve nothing but synth G and endless darkness. You hear me? I'm nodding. If I try to talk, I'll cry. I think for just a moment about telling them how old I am. How old I was when Dad caught the secret of the sauce recipe before the paper was sucked into space. I'm the only one who knows how. It's not recorded anywhere. It can't be. I think about my tomatoes back on the Mehedible, the UV lights that are my sons. I swallow and stand up straighter from my adopted mushrooms, my babied, nurtured sourdough starter. I have to go home to them. Somebody does. I'm the only one who can do this work. I understand. My voice sounds better than I thought it would. Silence for a few beats. We don't want to see you here again. There's nowhere else to get mushrooms. Nowhere at all. I put my hands down and I nod. I spit blood inside my helmet. Of course, with your permission, I'll return to my ship. We'd never hear the end of it if we heard the pizza boy, one of them says, mockingly. He might be the last one. How long's it been since you saw another? The last one they knew was my father. I'm certain of it. Shit, sectors ago. I was a little girl, not even shaving yet. You barely shave now, XKE. Eat shit. The one with the blaster gestures at my trove of purple mushrooms. If you eat these, you pretty much already do. Their conversation has nothing to do with me. I return to my clip and ribbon that will pull me back to my scooter. I wish I knew their ship. I wish they had to print their registry on their suits or identify themselves at all. XKE, like that's useful. I never want to deliver to those Marines, but I guess they're all the same. And I can't call attention to myself. Back on the Mehedible, it's easier to be busy than to be mad. I drop my kit and suit in the tomato corridor and I go, just in my underthings, to the galley. The starter has to be fed every day. I've used flour from every grain in the galaxy, tough, rough milled brown stuff and the fine, pale rich people silt. I've used flour that they said was made from grass that grew on a turtle's back and yeast that I grew in a bag from dried fruit and wine that I salvaged after a party cruiser collided with a fuel freighter. The whole time I thought the fuel might ignite, but I saw floating bags of yellow fruit leather bound together in a cargo net. It was worth it. 
If I go out in the instant of a blue-white hot fuel explosion with exotic fruits in my hands, what's better than that? Nothing is better than this moment. My hands punch down and roll the dough just like Dad taught me. The microbes that grow on my hands are his and my mother's. Some of them have been with me since our last cat, Nedjeb, died. Microbes carry everything. They don't speak, but they swallow all of history. They're like mushrooms that way, like me. The dough is stretched and oiled, and I have crusts for tonight and tomorrow. The starter has grown and bubbled, and I put it lovingly back in the bowl that it's always lived in since before my grandfather. It's crazed, whitish old polymer made trash, ancient. The markings on the bottom are from a script I can't read, including a strange symbol of a triangle made out of arrows. To me, it means that the starter makes the bread, makes the starter. The dead who plant the spores, that feed the mushrooms, that make the spores. Everything is a cycle like that. Delivering pizza is a cycle. The orders come in over the comm and I tell them I'm out of mushrooms tonight. I have a good dry salami and the means to shave it thinner than a hair. I'll make it last and the engine's heat will make it crisp. This batch of sauce turned out great. I'll deliver to them, even the Marines. I'll take their cred and I'll drink their shitty grain alcohol in some illicit asteroid bar, listening to hear if someone knows a mycologist or a cave diver. Somewhere else in the system, there are mushrooms. I know it. Rebellion is a cycle too. Imperial power creates its own enemies, which will bring it down one day. It leaves behind its own forgotten arsenals ready to be reclaimed. It puts the spores of mushrooms that will one day flourish on its corpse. There is no receiver in the scooter, so I just sing to myself. After nearly 12 hours, I can return to the Mehedible. It's tiring, and I'm so weary of identifying myself in the insulated delivery pod. Dad used to tell stories about delivering planet side, right to portals and gates, seeing the smile on someone who took their pizza and looked right at him. Maybe one day the QA will lead the system and I'll be able to do that again. Maybe I'll touch dirt and see what Dad was so excited about. I've made enough sauce for a few slow days, so I don't have to bother the tomatoes for a while, and that's fine. They like to be left alone. They grow best when I keep the UV dial about halfway up and let them do their thing. I think about the coordinates encoded in their DNA. I think about how important it is to the rebels inside the QA. Dad said there was no other way to get it to them that hadn't been figured out. This one was safe because we kept it secret. And this is my job now. Walking down the short corridor to where they grow, I thought hard about the mushrooms. There had to be another way to get some. Mushrooms on a pizza mean that the Praetor is retreating against the resistance, being driven back. When they ask me how I can be out of mushrooms, how could I forget? I know what they're asking. They want better news. The sea cheese dealers who received the last signal told me that he was in retreat again. They told me this by the weight of their cheese plugs. More than a kilo each, and the Praetor is being pushed back. We never say this out loud. I read the number on the scale and I sigh, good news or bad. We never know who's watching. And tonight, the pizzas have got to have mushrooms. They just have to. I have a few dried ones saved for emergency and they're gonna have to do for now. In the wet and warm of my grow room, my eyes adjust to the light. I forgot that I dropped my kid in here after I lost the mushrooms on LU5. The bag is made of some skin, something my dad killed or bought from the butcher, who knows? Probably soaked in my old sweat and his. I guess it's as good as a corpse. Probably. Some of those spores found their way into it, and in the few seconds when we were close, I can see the tiny pink spots that prefigure the growth of purple mushrooms. I go to the kitchen and I get some scraps. Any organics will do, right? I open the mouth of the bag and I nestle something that will rot into their folds. I put an old pot over it and shield it from the tomato's UV. I stand up in the light of my own little suns and I smile at the battered pod that gives shade to my mushroom spores. I find my vacuum sealed bags of dried mushrooms that will do for tonight. And even if it's one per pie, that'll be enough to carry the message. These spores will grow into purple mushrooms and give off spores of their own. And that's their place in the cycle. Being the pizza boy is mine. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. And where, where can we find that again?
Fantasy and Science Fiction, September, October 2022. There you go. <laughs> so thank you, Meg, and, and thank you, Clay, and thanks to all of you. You know, stick around, buy books, come up to the authors, say hello, buy drinks, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next month. Woo! listening to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB reading series. Check out our website at kgbfantasticfiction.org and click on support if you'd like to help keep the series going. Anyway, that's our show. Thanks for listening and see you next month.